Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez, and my special guest today is Pam Lopez. Pam, welcome to the show. Hello. Welcome. This is uh, the first time that Pam's been on the show, and she's with me today to share her experiences as a business owner, more specifically her most recent business, which she has been operating for 10 years, her travel consulting business, and also the challenges of working together uh, with a spouse. We're going to chat about that as well. To get more information about the Howa business, including the show notes page for this episode, and to learn more about my coaching programs, please visit thehowabusiness.com. I also invite you to consider supporting this podcast by joining my group coaching program on Patreon. And please subscribe wherever you might be listening to this episode so you don't miss any future episodes. Let me tell you a little bit more about Pam. Pam Lopez, my wife, is a business owner, and her latest business venture is L3 Destinations. L3 Destinations is her custom travel consulting business, which she started back in 2014. So over the past 10 years, she has successfully helped her travel clients to create custom voyages around the world. From European trips to adventures in Alaska and Antarctica and cruises to all parts of the world, Pam has helped hundreds of individuals and families realize their dream of travel. Pam started her work career as a flight attendant with American Airlines. And after 14 years with American, she took an early retirement package to stay home and raise our daughter, McKenna. Her first small business experience came when she helped me with Old World Salons. We'll chat about that experience briefly. That was a salon suites business that we bought, owned it for six years, and then sold them in 2014. And Pam was responsible for the back office operations, including accounts payable and the banking. And she also managed our front desk staff. So an integral role in helping me and my brother uh, operate this business. So that's a little bit about her background. So once again, Pam Lopez, welcome for the first time to the How a Business podcast. Thank you. I've been trying to convince you to come on for some time. I've been doing this show for, I think it's seven years now. And you finally out of the blue one uh, here recently said, I want to be on the show. It was on my to-do list. Like one of the things you wanted to accomplish this year? Mm -hmm. For my goals, my business goals. Yeah. No. Well, I appreciate it. I'm glad that you finally were willing to come on. So- I always like to start kind of at the beginning. Uh, First question I have for you is when you think back to your younger days, when you were a kid, a teenager, when you were in college for that matter, did you ever think you might own a business someday? Thinking back then, did you ever think you might own a business? No, I think growing up and especially in college, it didn't even come to my mind that I would have my own business. I would be able to run my own business. I just thought you got a job and you worked. Mm -hmm. And you ended up, uh, as it turns out, working for American. But let's go step back. What did you end up studying in uh, university? Um, I went to UTA and I went to study architecture. It was a little bit more than I had planned because of the math. (laughs) I hate math. (laughs) So, Um, so, yeah. So I did switch gears and changed my major to advertising with a minor in marketing. Um, I enjoy the artistic side of the advertising and also the planning that that was involved. Mm -hmm. But then uh, after you graduate, was it shortly thereafter? No, you were working somewhere and then you got this opportunity with American, right? Yes, I was working at the International Wildlife Park in Grand Prairie in the office. Uh, with their marketing staff. And uh, I was given an opportunity to go work for American. I was a little unsure of change. Wasn't sure I wanted to take it, but my boss had said, if you don't take it, I'm going to fire you. (laughs) So he knew I needed to get out and do something different and be adventurous. Yeah. And to put this in further context, you grew up for the most part in Longview, which is in East Texas, a small city in East Texas. And then you had moved to the big city of Dallas, but but still you were kind of sheltered there. So this was an opportunity for you to go literally go see the world, right? Correct. I just wanted to be adventurous and take a small piece of my next chapter of my life and go see something. Mm-hmm. 
So you did that for 14 years. You and I met towards the end of that. And, and then we got married and had McKenna. And, and that's when you decided we had an opportunity. You decided to, to go ahead and stay at home and take that early retirement package that they had at the time. Correct. Correct. Yes. I just, at that point, um, our schedules were too, weren't consistent enough and it kept overlapping and I didn't have anyone to take care of McKenna. So I chose to take the early retirement and take the opportunity that you gave me uh, to stay at home to be a mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we worked together at it and we managed our finances, I think, pretty well to be able to afford that. At the time, I was working full time, like you alluded to, traveling a lot. And, and of course, you were as well as a flight attendant. So that just did not mesh well. And uh, let's see, at that time, around that time, I was still owning the the pizza franchises. And so I was in yes. that business. So you knew that I always wanted to do that full time. And then shortly after McKenna was born, I got into real estate. But then uh, 2007, I believe it was, we uh, decided to start a business with family, <laughs> which is which is always uh, something people tell you not to do, but we've done it and we've done it well and we've done it with challenges. But nonetheless, we we landed on buying an existing business called Old World Salons, and these are salon suites. I didn't know what that was. Did, did you, did, thinking back, did you even know that that type of business existed? I did. I did. I had switched around from hairstylist to hairstylist, getting my hair colored and cut. So I knew that was kind of more of the newer trend. Mm -hmm. So I knew exactly what they did. I knew what the concept was. Yeah. So and I, I, I probably had some idea of it, but I really didn't understand it as a business model. So once we looked into it, we thought, well, this might be a fit for us because we spent some time really vetting out different businesses. You know, I often help people with the process of that. I call it the ideation phase or people call it the ideation phase, different ideas. And we went through different things, different ideas. And then this came to us, we looked at it and all of us thought, all of us meaning you and I and my brother and his wife at the time, this is a great match for us. It really is a property management type business with very few employees. At that time, that model that we had had one receptionist and so that was the only employee. And then we we ran the the relations with the tenants. And and for somebody who doesn't understand it, these uh, hairstylists, estheticians, massage therapists, they were not our employees. They were our tenants. We leased out individual rooms to them. But that was then your first venture into helping me run a business. When you think back about that, those early days or getting into it, do you remember how you felt about it? The prospect of now being part of a business ownership? Um, at the time, I was very nervous about it. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I knew that you would be there to help me and to guide me, to give me the tools that I needed, but it was something very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. When you think back to some of the, uh, certainly the early challenges, what, what comes to mind that were early challenges for you? I think my biggest challenge was just having enough confidence in myself to either A, figure it out, or B, ask for help. Mm -hmm. So I think um, business owners need to understand that there is a time where you have to ask for help, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also there's always this fear of, boy, am I going to make a, a catastrophic mistake? But listen, we we weren't saving people's lives, right? <laughs> it was a, it right. was a salon. So there, yeah, yeah, sometimes it could feel like it's a huge mistake, but but that's not really the case. You know, one of the things that we ended up developing, and you helped me with this, was to develop a very comprehensive manual. We had both a front desk manual that our receptionist followed that had everything from, you know, unlocking the door to making the coffee to shutting down at night and everything else in between. And then we had a back office manual that walked you step by step through the procedures that we had back then to do the back office stuff, the financial stuff. And I think that that helped you tremendously, right? Absolutely. When I first started working with the manual, it it brought a, a peace and calm to the processes that we had for the back office. Then towards the end, I didn't even have to open it. I had a lot of confidence in myself, but I knew it was always there in case I needed to refer to it. So those those manuals of operation really did give me a lot of comfort and uh, peace when I went to do all the things I needed to do in the back office. 
And that's an example of a system. And if you've been listening to my show for some time, you know that obviously I'm big on systems. But I can tell you for a fact, having managed the sale of this business that we're talking about here, that having those systems in place had a big positive impact to the potential buyers because they saw it as something where the knowledge was not going to walk out the door when you left or I left. There was a process to follow that they could pick right up, right? And that was huge. I don't know if you remember that or not, but the people who bought it and other people, we had several people who were interested. That was a big selling point is the fact that we had these systems in place. Correct. And there's only so much business knowledge I came into it with. So with those systems, it gave me the confidence to learn more. Um, what I did already know was the human aspect of it, how to get along with tenants, how to build relationships. I already had that. I had that specification. I, I That came easy to me. But with all the systems you created, it kind of meshed together well. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that was our first time working together as husband and wife and other family members. <laughs> <laughs> so it has its challenges. Yeah. I've talked about that many times on this show that, that really there's no doubt I was the one that needed to adjust and change my, my tone and my approach. And, you know, the question I always asked myself, I learned to ask myself is, would I approach it that way? Or would I speak that way to an employee, the way that I'm thinking about, or just spoke to my wife. And, and so it took some time and it was me, you were very patient. It was me that had to learn how to do that well, but, Thinking back to it, what, what did you think about that experience overall of working with your spouse? You know, it's one of those things where I have to um, put it into perspective when I go to work and we disagree on something that stays at work. Or if we're at home and I got mad at you for not putting the dishes away or picking up your clothes, I don't bring that to work and still get mad at you for that. I have to separate them. And it's, it's hard to do. But I've got my husband at home and my husband at work. And it's two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, with my brother. You know, we had to make sure we drew a line, regardless of what issues we might be having personally in our lives with him. The business was the business. And we had to make sure to separate that or compartmentalize those things. Correct. I, you know, I had a lot of issues personally with your brother. But once we got to work, we worked as a team. We worked very well together. We were open and honest and everything seemed to flow so evenly with him, not bringing our personal business into our business. Yeah. Yeah. He was really good at being able to draw that line and getting the work done. When somebody now asks you, Hey, you, you've done it. What do you think about working with your spouse or working with a family member? What, what do you typically advise to people who are considering that? It can be done. You just have to be very patient and you can't let the two overlap and just not get your feelings hurt. <laughs> um, they, It is going to be a learning curve and it could be a big curve for both of you, but it is possible that you can work together peacefully. Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things I advise is like with any partnership, that you have those very specific conversations before you start the business as to who's going to play what role, you know, what are the delineations, who's, who ultimately makes the decision. You know, in that case, I was the majority owner and that was purposeful such that there wasn't any issue about at the end of the day, I'm going to gather people's input and give some authority to you and to my brother, but I'm going to make the ultimate decision. And I think that that helped. So being very clear on the roles and who's involved and who's not involved, I think is a, is a big deal to making that work. All right. Yeah, so setting up, setting up boundaries, boundaries. Yes, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's critical, I think. But the mm -hmm. thing is though, Pam, is that I find that people do that after the fact they try to establish boundaries yes. and I get it. You don't know what all those boundaries might be up front, but ideally you have some level of boundaries established before you start the business. Correct. All right. So we sold that business. We owned it for six years, very successful. We sold the business and then you moved in travel consulting. What, what, uh, obviously, you know, so you're going to share here are the obvious that you had that background and we love to travel as a family as do you, but what attracted you to the travel consulting business? If you can think back to those days. When I was a flight attendant, I loved the adventure of travel. 
um, it was a job that I did very well. I loved it. I loved going to work and thinking about the next chapter in my life. It would only make sense to do something that I, I actually loved. I love travel. I love adventure. I love giving people travel. I love giving them adventures. I have loved travel for, for many years since I was a flight attendant. And I wanted to share that with people and let people know that, you know, you can travel, you can do this on a budget or whatever this, the constraints are. I want to offer them that. And it feels good to do that, to do something I love. Right. I think also you brought to it and then now you've refined a couple of uh, skill and then a trait. I would say the skill is your organizational abilities. You're good at managing, you know, what can turn out to be a complex trip with multiple pieces and multiple moving parts. You just did a, a group trip that had, I don't know how many people in different stops and different itineraries. So you're good at organizing those kind of things. So your organizational skills, I think, come to bear. What, what do you think? Uh, yes, I think just being organized and listening to my clients, listening to their wants, but also letting them know, yes, I hear what you want, but this is something I think you need. So I think a key thing is being able to listen deeply to your clients, um, taking to account their budget, whether it be large or small, letting them know that you're going to work with them until you find the absolute perfect fit of travel for them. Every one of my trips is custom made. There's no two trips alike because there are no two clients alike. Mm -hmm. And my big group that just got back from Europe, there were 16 of them. Sometimes it felt like herding cats <laughs> and I worked on it for over a year, but it was, it was perfect for them. It was exactly, exactly what they needed. So to be able to listen to your client and read between the lines, sometimes they think they want something, but if you suggest something else and tell them why, then they realize that's what's best for that situation. So listening to your clients is key to my it's business. Not un, it's not uncommon for me to hear you say, oh yeah, this client is thinking about Hawaii, but oh, they ended up in Italy, right? So it just it, it just depends because sometimes people need that help. That's one of the reasons they come to a travel consultant like you is the traveler that knows that they need some help figuring out where to go. And they don't have the time nor necessarily the desire to put it all together, right? Correct. Um, so you mentioned listening skills. That's correct. That's another huge uh, trait ability that you have. I think it's combined with patience was the other thing I was going to, I was alluding to is you have to have patience in this business because like you just said, it took you a year to plan this particular trip. Sometimes I hear you on the phone on hold with a particular travel partner for hours, literally, or people changing their mind, which is their prerogative to do. So I think that patience plays a big role as well, doesn't it? Correct. I've, I've had clients call me from Spain, uh, international call saying, it's hot here. What do <laughs> I do? And I just have to take a deep breath and tell them, you know what? Just calm down, you know, go out, get a fan, you know, let's try to think of something you can do indoors today. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of patience involved. Yeah. Um, when you think back, it's been 10 years. So when you think back to those early days, what are some of the early challenges? You know, I asked you this about oh, salons, but what were the early challenges that you can remember that you had to overcome in this business? My early challenges um, came when people wanted to use me, wanted to use an agent, but they really were the type of people that were meant to go to Expedia and do it the cheapest way possible. And I had to realize that there are two kinds of clients, and those are the clients I'm never going to be able to please. They don't understand my value as a travel advisor. And they just want the cheapest booking their cruise through Costco. And when I can't match that, I can't impress upon them that by booking with me instead of Costco, they are getting my expertise and my value and they don't see my value. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of upsetting to me at first. It hurt my feelings, but I soon realized that's just the type of people they are. 
Oh, and this is also the classic example of understanding who is your ideal target market? Who is that ideal client and focusing on, because there's plenty of those people out there and that's what you have to build a business around, right? Correct. Those are the people that see my value. When someone comes to me and they want a two week trip to, let's say Italy, um, I have a planning fee. And if at first they don't feel want to pay the fee, then they don't see my value. Those aren't really the clients that I'm going to win over. Um, nor nor be able my- to serve very well because that's not your specialty isn't finding the best deals. Uh, your Correct. specialty is in the customization and the, and the putting together what ends up being, you know, maybe not in some cases a once in a lifetime, but a, but an incredible experience. And that's what you focus on. Correct. I don't have a crystal ball every morning that says, oh, here's a really cheap deal for you. I don't have that. I don't do that. Those aren't the clients that I am gearing towards. I want those clients that understand I put a customized Italy vacation for you. And I think of everything, insurance, transfers, um, trains, customized tours, Um, a cooking class in Italy so you can learn to make pasta. I'll call those experiences. That's what I do. And that is the value of using me as a travel consultant is I can give you that customized once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, I think that, uh, so you've touched there on, on what your ideal client is. And for anybody who's thinking that they might start a travel consulting business, that's what it's about. You're not going to win in the, uh, lowest price game others are going to beat you there the internet places like costco so that that's not your client and so what pam does very well is she qualifies people by understanding what it is they're looking for and and then uh, she they those people keep coming back as well i mean a large portion if you look at this year so far uh, we, i don't we haven't run the numbers but a large percentage are repeat customers right repeat clients correct. yeah correct I have my base set of clients that come to me once or twice a year and they refer me to their friends and I have clients all over the United States. This is Henry Lopez with a brief break from this episode to share a business opportunity with our show advertiser, the Amazon Delivery Service Partner Program. The Amazon Delivery Service Partner Program, or Amazon DSP, is designed to empower leaders who want to launch and operate their own delivery business. Amazon DSP empowers leaders like you to launch and operate your own delivery small business and work with Amazon to make an impact on your community. Since Amazon DSP launched in 2018, over 3,500 delivery service program partners have built their own business with Amazon across 19 countries, creating over 275,000 jobs and delivering over a billion packages to customers around the world. Amazon is looking for hands-on owners with grit who want to hire and motivate a high-performing team of local delivery associates. No existing logistics experience is required, but it is helpful to have great customer service skills and experience managing a team. By partnering with Amazon, you'll have access to exclusive deals, services, and best-in-class technology at every stage of your business. And the Amazon DSP team will provide ongoing support as you work to launch and grow your delivery business. Learn more about the Amazon Delivery Service Partner Program and apply today at amazon.com forward slash radio. That's amazon.com forward slash radio. You can also find the link on the show notes page for this episode at thehowofbusiness.com. All right. So we talked about some of the main challenges, the misconceptions. What else would you offer as well as far as advice to someone who might be thinking of getting into the travel consulting business? What what have we not touched on that comes to light that's either a challenge or maybe a misunderstanding, but a piece of advice you would give to them? I think a misunderstanding is that people think, okay, I'm going to be a travel consultant. Um, I'm going to go with a host agency and they're going to bring me all of these clients. All of these leads for you to work. Leads. Correct. That's a misconception. You are still going to have to go out and get them. You are still going to have to put yourself out there. I am a very shy person. I find it hard in a big group of people to stand up for who I am and what I do. 
that is one huge thing that I've learned since becoming my own business owner is that no one's going to advocate for my business but me. So I take every single opportunity I have to get a client, even if it's standing in line in a grocery store and somebody comments on a travel t-shirt, which I wear a lot. Um, and I say, oh, well, yes, I'm a travel agent and, you know, I, I host many trips and I provide all kinds of custom itineraries. I just, that is one perfect way to open up to somebody new and let them know what you do. And I give them my business card. So there's so many opportunities in the day for you to do that. If you don't have those regular avenues, like when I first started my daughter was in band in high school. Tons of people I met from band or color guard or Girl Scouts, any of those avenues with school, PTO, you meet people and they know that you're a travel advisor. It gets a little bit harder if you don't have those avenues. But like I said, you have to create them. You have to go and create them, even if it's at the grocery store. You have to get those clients. And when you're doing that, you're also vetting them. When they ask you questions like, oh, well, I go to Costco all the time and book my cruises. And I always respond, oh, that's great. You can save a little bit of money with Costco. But when something goes wrong, are you going to sit on hold with Costco? Or are you going to call me so that I can help you? Yeah, well, well said. I think that two things there that I want to touch back on. Uh, what you're talking about there to a big extent is sales and marketing, but the sales part of it, and obviously knowing you, if I would have told you, you got to do that extensively to be successful 10 years ago, you would have at least cringed if not said, no, that's not me. Right. Well, you told me to fire someone at old world salons <laughs> and I did. And then I cried. All right. So but, I've but come a long way different from that. Than, of course, <laughs> a long way, but that's different than the point is you now very naturally and comfortably put yourself out there and understand that the business is out there, not in here. In other words, they're not going to come to you. I mean, they Correct. will, they will through referrals, but you have to sell it. And that's something that I think was very much against your personality or your nature before you did this business. Correct. I have, and now I have confidence in myself, but it really helps that what I'm actually selling is what I love. Exactly. That's that's the key. You have you believe in what you're offering. I sell my passion. Mm -hmm. I believe in what I do. I believe in my talents. I believe in what I have to offer people. What is the motto? I think you have it on your business card now. Or the uh, it's not a tagline. It's more of a motto that you have. What is that? It's travel is the only thing you buy that makes you richer. Yeah, love that. Okay, mm -hmm. the other thing I want to come back to is the network. I think that if you're looking to get into this business, a huge advantage is some kind of a network. Like Pam mentioned, she was very much involved in McKenna's school when she was in, in grade school. Um, you know, her friend Wendy had a tremendous network of friends and people that she knows. Something like that that you can tap into and you have to tap into it. You have to go tell people, this is what I do now. But that is huge as an advantage, just like being a realtor. And I was a realtor in the early 2000s. A lot of it is going to be on your personal and business network that you can tap into and generate clients that way. Um, all right. You touched on a host agency. And so explain at a high level, you, you belong to a host agency. At a high level, what is the role that they play in your business? Well, a host agency is like an umbrella. And under that umbrella... What I get from my host agency are higher commissions than if I was just an independent uh, travel consultant. I get training, all the support services I need. I get access to suppliers. If I'm having an issue booking a celebrity trip, I can call my business development manager, Barbara, and say, Barbara, I'm, I need help. And so I have those people that can help me and support me. Um, Home-based travel consultants working independently is a little harder. Um, I think a host agency is a network of people. We all work together. We have a Facebook page. And when you have something new that you, that you just can't figure out, throw it on the Facebook page and multiple people try to help you figure it out. Mm -hmm. So you're not alone. 
you're working with a family that's under that umbrella and everyone wants each other to succeed. I think, and I uh, think that's what a host agency helps you with yeah, succeeding. I mean, I mean, it could be, you know, how do I find that private charter in, uh, in, in Italy or in the Mediterranean somewhere to, you know, how do I exactly put together an Antarctica trip uh, if you haven't done it before? So it's there as a resource, but also going back to the point of prices or deals, often you can in fact get amenities, let's call them that, or perks that because you're buying with a group that an individual may not have access to. Correct. You know, Let's look back at that cruise that you book from Costco. Yeah, you might get it a little bit cheaper because they're selling you something that's guaranteed and you don't actually get a stateroom yet. But what I book into is maybe a group from uh, my host agency. Someone in there has a group and I'm going to book into it so I can get you extra onboard credit. I can get you a better uh, price point. So it's all those extra amenities that I could look for you that are provided by my host agency. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you leverage, the other thing that I like about this industry, and uh, there are some industries that have this, others that don't, is associations where you can become a member. You're a member of at least one of them, right? Which one Correct. is that? Correct. Which one is yes. it that you're a member of? Um, I am a member of ASTA. ASTA. And, and, and so these associations and groups and your host agency they provide a certain level of certification. So you got some initial training that got you some base levels of certification, correct? Correct. And then also they do education events. Now you, uh, depending on the, where it is and here you've been at it for 10 years, you may or may not get the most value from it, but certainly starting out, it was a tremendous opportunity to go to these conferences. You went to several in, in Vegas and to learn and to be with other people who are starting out or that have more knowledge that was a, a huge opportunity for you getting started, at least in this business, right? Correct. Just talking again about cruise lines, everybody has their own training available to you. And when you finish the training, then you're certified. Mm -hmm. So the more certifications you can get, the better off you are. You're more knowledgeable. Just Disney alone is huge. And there's a lot of components with Disney. But being with the host agency, you have the ability to go in and do their training. And the, it's an educational opportunity. Yeah, and it's, it's incredibly invaluable up front. And even ongoing. I mean, you've gone to conferences now and you'll meet different vendors uh, in different parts of the world that you then develop a, a relationship with and understand what it is that they offer, how to work with them. All of those are opportunities to become better and better and better at serving your clients. Yeah. And they all, you know, a lot of the companies offer consistent webinars to host agencies. So I try to do at least one webinar a month on a company that is new to me or one to refresh myself with. What mm -hmm. is going on new in company XYZ? Yeah. All right. I put together a short list. I was thinking about this, your pros and cons of starting a travel consulting business. And I kind of want to run through these lists and you can give me some comments. Let's start with the negative first or potential negative. Certainly from a business perspective, one of the big challenges that's obvious is there's a what we call a low barrier to entry. In other words, it doesn't take much. It's going to be a benefit here in a moment as well, but it doesn't take much to get started. And in fact, I, I haven't looked back, but we probably started your business with 500 bucks, right? So it, yeah. there's not a big investment mm -hmm. that has to be made. But if we're looking at it from the negative the problem is there's a there's a gazillion travel consultants, especially here in Florida, right? Correct. A lot so of lots Florida. of competition, lots of and listen to differentiate is hard until people get to know you and work with you. So that's one of the disadvantages. There certainly has been over time a downward trend on commissions. These larger travel companies, the cruise companies, Disney. They're all uh, part of this push to have people book themselves online. And a lot of people do. Obviously, we talked about that. That's not who you're going after. But nonetheless, it's it's a challenge. Commissions are a challenge. And that's one of the reasons you charge a booking fee for those more complex travel arrangements that you're going to make, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, low barrier entry lets anyone who thinks they want to start something say, okay, I'm going to start it yeah. without any second thought as to 
you know, what the advantages and the disadvantages and weighing what they are good at. Now, fortunately, so you have a lot of agents. You have a lot of agents. Now, I haven't looked at the statistics recently, but I saw some statistics a while back that the majority are agents are kind of hobbyists. They they book travel every once in a while. They book it for their friends. They think, oh, this will be a great way to get great deals. And sometimes that might be the case. But yeah, there, there's a, like anything else, it's the 20% that are generating most of the business. And that's the case here. Um, right. Those competing... great deals are not coming to the to those kind of agents. That's right. They're big not. Big companies that make a lot of money. They work with the agents that make a lot of money. Yeah, so... it's, it's obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And then we talked about you're competing against the internet and other discount travel partners, you know, and so Pam has learned to properly qualify a client so that she doesn't go and spend a lot of time helping somebody put together an itinerary and then they just go book it online, right? Correct. Um, and so she's gotten very good at that. Of course, she knows her regular clients don't do that. They value the work that she puts in and the effort. But that's one of the reasons she also uses that fee, that booking fee as a qualifier. Someone who balks at that, well, they're probably not a good fit. And so that's one of the reasons that she does that. And most, I think most of the top travel agents now do that, uh, charge some kind of a fee. Um, so those are some of the negatives. Anything else I missed there? Yeah. Um, I think, I think one of the biggest negatives is pay. Um, let's talk about that trip that we had just mentioned earlier, my trip of 16 people that I worked on over a year. I never saw any of that pay. Uh, you don't see it until they travel. Right. So, and even you then might there's a bit of a something. delay. So, so, exactly. Cause yeah. it goes to my host agency and then it comes to me. Yeah. So, you know, you don't get that steady paycheck, you know, one month could be nothing. And then the next month it's just, you know, you get a lot of commission. So you have to be able to factor in financially that it's not steady and that has to work with your lifestyle. Yeah, no, that's a great point that I didn't even think about adding here is that instability. And in, so you have to be good at budgeting. There's no way you can, you know, that month that you do knock it out of the park. If you think now that's going to continue, you're in trouble, right? So you have to balance it out and look at how the year went to determine how much you're going to take out of the business. Um, right. Yeah, Just that, thinking of that point. one, that one big trip, you know, I made X, Y, Z, but you have to factor that over over a year that exactly. I had worked on it. Exactly. All right. On the, on the positive side is I think number one, certainly for you is the flexibility, right? Yes, absolutely. I have plenty of time to do what I want to go volunteer like in the mornings. And then in the afternoons I work, sometimes I'll work at night when my clients are off work after they put the kids to bed, maybe on the weekend. So the flexibility is, is all mine. And I'm able to do everything and juggle it exactly the way I want it. Yeah, that's that's huge. Also, uh, flexibility of location. You know, we we often will go up to to New York City to spend time with our daughter, and we both will just work from there, work from the hotel room, and you can still get your business done, right? Right. When I first started, um, a lot of my clients were in Coppell, where we lived in Texas, and I love to put a trip together for them. And then go over to their house and explain it to them. We mm -hmm. would go over everything. That's still available. We can still do that over FaceTime. And I still do that a lot with my clients. You know, I send them a packet of stuff. We FaceTime and we go over it. I make sure they know everything they need to do. And they understand all of their paperwork. So I'm still able to, to do that with my client and be flexible with them, even though I live in Florida. Yeah. Right. So we touched on the low startup cost. So that's a benefit. If we're looking at it from the positive side, it doesn't take much money to get started in this business. You have some fees and associations and some initial trading and ramp up time. That's really the more expensive thing is the ramp up time, the time before you're going to start uh, closing some business and booking some trips. And, and like Pam explained, the delay in getting paid, you have to deal with that. So it really does serve well for somebody where they're in the household as a primary income and you're not depending on this income necessarily, at least not on a monthly basis, or as a side hustle, you're going to keep your your day job and do this on the side. It can be done. It's challenging because people people want to talk when they want to talk, but they also have jobs. And so often Pam will be talking to her clients in the evenings or on the weekends because they're also busy. So it can be done as a side hustle. 
at least as a way to get started. You know, for Pam, she she only works. What, what would you say? Because this is not. I would not say it's full time. You still going back to the flexibility point. You've got the business to where you want it, where you can also do other things, right? Correct. Yeah. I I know exactly what needs to be done. I have my routine in the morning and my clients know that I'm not a morning person, but they can <laughs> call me at 10 o'clock at night and that's fine. So I have portions of the day where I get things done, but I have plenty of time to do other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You volunteer a lot. In other words, you, you're not working in this business every day, eight hours a day. Sometimes it is. There are days when you put in the whole day. But but uh, but you have a lot of flexibility. Like you're you're gone all day, almost on Wednesdays, uh, at least in the morning, volunteering, and part of the day on Thursday. So you're able to do the other things that you want to get done in your life. Correct. Yeah. And there's always you know the one offs, this this latest shutdown um, with the airlines. I had a client that was stuck in JFK, and so that required a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But it's just one of those one offs. That's what yeah. I do. But I, I think the other flip side of flexibility is you have to be okay with taking that call on a Saturday. Someone who's stranded in, in the middle of nowhere on a Sunday, you, you got to be flexible. It doesn't happen very often. It really does not interrupt our lives very much, but you do have to have that flexibility and be able to help people when they need it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. So the flexibility of schedule and time, the low startup costs, the the host agencies and the associations that are there to help you with that initial training and knowledge about the product. Again, that doesn't exist in all industries, but very strong in this industry. And so that's a big plus, in my opinion, if you're thinking about starting a travel consulting business. And then, of course, there's the travel, right? <laughs> so it goes right. back to at the heart of it. We get to do some travel, don't we? Right. And I think um, I wanted to add another positive thing is for me, when a client comes to me and says something, you know, that I've never heard of, it's so exciting trying to do all the research to plan this new adventure. I had a client that said, all of a sudden, I want to go to the Chilean fjords. <laughs> and I was like, well, I kind of knew where they were, but other than that, nothing. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is like such an adventure to you know, it stimulates me to go, Oh, wow. Let me look into that. It's so exciting. It's so almost like I, you're going to go, right? It, I do. I actually travel through them and they send me pictures and, um, but I think it's the adventure of it is such a positive thing that you, every day is something new and you keep learning and it's, I'm learning something that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And you're helping, you're helping people. I mean, this is, I was trying to find some research on you know, things that people want to do on their bucket list. And most people you talk to will say, oh, I want to travel more. I want to travel. So you're helping people because of the type of clients you work with, which is these, these really experiences. I hate saying once in a lifetime because that's, I'd never believe that, right? Yes, there right. are some clients that their budgets are only going to allow for one of those spectacular trips every so often. But but most of your clients, unfortunately, can afford that, to have that incredible trip once or once a year, once every couple of years. But anyway, you're helping people with realizing that so precious thing of being able to create experiences with the people whom they're traveling with, their loved ones, their friends and family. And us having traveled so much, our, the two of us and with our daughter and her fiance, we completely understand the value of that. Correct. I, you know, I love, I love quote, selling experiences. So curious, I, I looked up, this is, and of course, depending on whose list you look at, it's slightly different, right? But I was just curious as to the top, I looked up the top 10 foreign foreign destinations for Americans uh, in 2023. Number one was Mexico. And so, I, you know, that's obvious. 80 million Americans visited Mexican last, Mexico last year, which is incredible, with Cancun being the most popular city. Then mm -hmm. European destination number one, you know what it is. Italy. Italy, yeah. Italy was number one, Rome specifically, with 5 mm -hmm. million American visitors last year. Last year was crazy, wasn't it, for mm -hmm. Italy? Oh, it was. Italy, yeah. 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 It's just people came out of COVID. It's like, I want to go to Italy. And so yeah. they did. Yeah, um, Venice is charging people to come in to the yes. city. 
because they're just over over mm -hmm. overflow to people. Yep. Barcelona is having the same challenge. Uh, then number three is the UK. So London, number right. three, four and a half million people annually. And then Spain, not surprisingly, one of our favorite places in the entire world, uh, Barcelona and Madrid specifically, two of our favorite cities in the world. About 3 million Americans visited last year. And then France and Paris in specific. Of course, this year with the Olympics, it's it's huge. But over 2 million people visited France last year. So I thought that was interesting. Nothing mm -hmm. surprising there to you, though. No, no. Um, when all right. When someone says Italy, I'm like, I figured. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, all right. Very good. So thanks for sharing all of that knowledge and your experiences with with the businesses. We talked about your first experience at Old War Salons and here these last 10 years of success you've had with all three destinations and uh, working with your husband and other family members, which is always its own particular challenge. I want to end with this question. Now that you've been a business owner for some time, what do you think you enjoy most about being your own boss? I like the flexibility of being able to run my own business, but when I want to go volunteer, I can go volunteer. And that brings me joy as well. So I had the flexibility to have more than just my business. That brings me so much joy. I have volunteer opportunities as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Excellent. And you're very good at it. And you have found something Thank again you. that, you, yeah, of course, you can combine something you're passionate about, which is always a great thing. And also apply, you know, your business knowledge that you've developed over the years to make this a business, not just a hobby. Correct. All right. Uh, the best place to find you, you actually don't have a website because there's really not a value there. You have a Facebook mm -hmm. page. So you can find L3, the letter L, the number three destinations on Facebook. Uh, or just contact me through the website at thehowabusiness.com and I'll get you in touch with Pam. I'll have a link to her Facebook page on the show notes page for this episode at thehowabusiness.com. Pam, thanks so much for the first time and hopefully you'll come back again. Now uh, that you one see thing I want to say before we, we leave is I truly believe travel is the only thing you buy that makes you richer. It's those adventures that enrich you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's why we travel so much. And that's why we have such great memories of our trips. And, you know, they can't take that away from you until, you know, nope. ho hopefully you don't lose your memory. But if that happens, that's the only time. But but you you take that. It's so much more valuable than material things. And I think that, again, that's one of the benefits of your business is you get to help people realize that. All right. All right. Thanks so much for being with me today. I appreciate you coming on the show for the first time. Well, thank you for having me. This is Henry Lopez, and thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again is my wife, Pam Lopez. I release new episodes every Monday morning, and you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts, including The How of Business YouTube channel and at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.